I was trying to think about uh, how to kind of bridge this space. We are now one week past you know, our celebration of Christmas Eve, right? that anticipation of our coming king. And today now we are on New Year's Eve, now the anticipation of this new year you know, and, and what that means for us. So as I was thinking about you know, what, what I can kind of talk about that's going to connect these things together, I, I really started um, trying to dig into this idea of, of Christ, you know, not just as this newborn baby and not only as our Savior, but specifically as our King, right, and what that really means for us. And so as I'm kind of digging through there, um, looking at, at different ideas, I was kind of drawn to uh, a passage in 1 Samuel. Uh, so I want to... Uh, to read this for you guys. This is from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8. So this is, um, if you're following with me in your Bibles, pretty close to the beginning of the Bible. We have, you know, um, we have the history of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, and then just a couple books forward from here now, right after Judges, right before Kings, right? This idea of Kings, we have uh, the book of 1 Samuel. In chapter 8, I'm starting in verse 4, uh, verse 4 through verse 9. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Will you pray with me? God, our Father, um, I pray today, God, that it is your voice that is heard. God, I pray that it is your wisdom that is shared. Um, nothing for me, God, that you would use me only as a tool. Lord, I pray that today and in the coming year, uh, God, we can truly appreciate what it means that you are our king. That this is something we don't forget or overlook. Um, that this could be a New Year's resolution, God, in all of our hearts, uh, to know you better, to love you better, to appreciate who you are as our King, and remember that every day. I pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There are a couple of things that kind of struck me in this passage as I was reading. And one of the things that kind of jumped out at me is that this passage in 1 Samuel doesn't say that God was frustrated or annoyed or disappointed or angry or upset, not explicitly, although it, it seems reasonable that that would be pretty upsetting. Um, but rather, it was, it was Samuel, right? It was Samuel who, who was upset by this explicitly. So the first thing I want to kind of focus on here is, is why should this be upsetting in the first place, um, you know, for Samuel and for God? Um, and particularly to look at how God has, up to this point in time, without necessarily demanding the label, he has served as king for the people of Israel. And he has provided faithfully for his people. Right? And he alludes to this from the day I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day. God has done so much for his people up to this point, serving them as king. From the very beginning, he gave life to his people, right? He chose this particular people, right? The descendants of Abraham. He made a promise to Abraham years and years ago that he was going to raise up a nation from him, something that should have been impossible, right? Abraham was almost 100 years old. His wife was 90 years old and barren. They had no children up at that point in time. There should not have been a massive descendant from this man, and yet there was. God made a promise and he fulfilled it. So this nation that he is reigning as king over only exists because of his miraculous power and love. 
He gave his people freedom when they were held captivity in Egypt, when they were beaten down as slaves. He set them free. He exerted his power in the plagues over Egypt. He parted the sea for them. He led them to their freedom. And then he sustained his people in the desert. He provided manna for food. He gave them water from rocks. And there was more. There's actually probably so much more that I don't think I've ever really thought about. Uh, I stumbled upon a passage in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 4, which says, Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your feet did not swell these 40 years. You can imagine for a moment. They were in the desert for 40 years. Right? They didn't have trade. They didn't have a place where they had settled down. There was no manufacturing. There was no processing. This is just one of these things that I guess I never really considered about what that means to wander in the desert for 40 years. They were wearing the same clothes. They didn't have anything new. Right? They had no opportunity to get it. And then walking in the desert, right? you can imagine how, how painful that must be, just walking day after day like that in the hot sands and everything. But God did not let their clothing wear out. God did not let their feet swell. He provided for them. He protected them. And I'm guessing probably in more ways than I can even consider. And he gave his people victory. Right? First over Pharaoh's army, an army that they had no power of their own to defeat. God defeated that army by himself, parting the Red Sea and closing it behind them as they made their escape. And then after those 40 years into the Promised Land, God gave them victory after victory they never could have earned on their own. Right? Starting when they marched around the walls of Jericho, a fortified city, they had no siege equipment, they had no resources to overcome this defense. God did that for them. He led them into victory smashed down the city walls. He gave them victory over kings. These people had no power of their own. They never should have had the victories that they did, only because they were led by God, their king. He provided for them faithfully as a perfect king, and yet they were still determined to find a new one. Unfortunately, leaders among men are imperfect. They had a perfect king, and they rejected him. That they were never going to get anything nearly as good as what they got. And I think one of the reasons why Samuel was so angry, and, and it doesn't tell us that God was angry or upset explicitly, is because God already knew this was going to happen. There was no surprise here for God whatsoever. And I, I just didn't really realize this, but in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verses 14 and 15, God is giving laws to his people he provides a law for the selection of a king. In Deuteronomy 17, 14 into 15, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. And then God proceeds to give some instructions for how to select a king. He takes you know, this knowledge that we were going to do this. We were going to reject him. We were going to demand something else, something less. And knowing that that is bad for us, that God is a perfect king, and any king we choose is not going to cut it, he, at the very least, out of his love and mercy for us, sets down some guidelines to give us a little bit of hope in that. Because I imagine if God just said, go ahead, pick a king, have fun with that, uh, some really, really bad things would probably happen. Uh, and they did anyway. Right, the, the kings that, that were chosen, they were good kings and bad kings, but all around none of them were what they needed to be. God knew this was going to happen, and then, and again, out of right, love and mercy for us, he gave a warning. He gave his people a chance to kind of like step back and realize, like, okay, I mean, this actually is a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> He told Samuel to warn the people what their king was going to be like. Uh, and back in 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting in verse 10, this is what he told them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen 
and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. That was the warning that they got. This is what you can expect. And of course, they said, oh man, that sounds terrible, right? We should probably stick with the God who has been faithfully providing for us and who rescued us out of Egypt and who gave us our kingdom and our land. And no, 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 no. They're like, yes, absolutely, that's it. We want a king just like all the other nations. We need that king. And then that's kind of what we've had ever since. It's kind of struck me that... Uh, We've kind of forgotten, maybe in a way, or at least I have, like what it really means to have a king at all, right? We haven't lived under a king now in over 200 years. You know, having rejected one for, gosh, what was it we didn't like about that king? Uh, maybe something to do with taking all these things from us and, right, not kind of giving, oh, <laughs> wait a minute, right? <laughs> you know, this, this warning is not just for the Israelites, not just for them, for the kings they were going to choose. This is what happens when we appoint people to lead us instead of God. God anticipated and he warned them that their leaders were going to be imperfect. So they had their good and their bad kings, right? They started off with Saul, not a great king by our standards, right? Didn't really do the best job. But then right after that, they had David, Right, David, who is exalted as this kind of heroic figure, who's called a man after God's own heart, who wrote this you know, beautiful poetry um, by our standards. Right, Good man, good king, still not perfect. David, as good a king as he may have been, did not have the power that God did to protect and preserve his people. David could not have sustained them for 40 years in the desert. David did make mistakes. David sinned pretty egregiously a couple of times uh, and paid quite a bit for it, but repented of that sin, which is why God allowed him to, to maintain his kingship. Uh, but ultimately, David died. A new king had to be chosen. And then that king died, and a new king had to be chosen. And there were ups and there were downs, and there were good kings and there were bad kings, but every single one of them imperfect kings. But that was okay. Okay because God knew this was going to happen. He knew that they wanted a king, and God already had established that there would be a perfect king. And God always had a plan for this perfect king. All the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 49, verse nine. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. God was choosing a perfect king for his people, a king that was going to come from the tribe of Judah. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. God had his plan for a perfect king. He gave some signs for what to look for, right? How to recognize this king. And now we know, right, who the king is, who was humble and mounted on a donkey. And that this king was going to be righteous. Righteous and having salvation is he. Saul was a better, uh, no, not Saul. David was a better king than Saul, but David was not righteous. David was not perfect. God chose a perfect king for us. And then in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, when Mary is visited by the angel, he tells her, he will be great and will be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
and of his kingdom there will be no end. We are meant to have a king. God's people were meant to have a king, but only one. Jesus Christ is the perfect king, the one that God had planned for and paved the way for since the beginning, since the very beginning. And he would rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom would have no end. This is a king who, though he will die for us, though he did die for us, was not stopped by death. Right? His reign did not end when he gave up his life, and he rose again to be king over his people forever. So how does that affect us now? Right? We had a king for a while, a couple hundred years ago. We didn't like it very much. We chose something new. But we still look to human leaders to fix our problems. And often enough to blame our problems on. Right? We look at the world around us and there's a lot that's wrong right, you know, right now, but really it's always been this way. There are wars going on. There are gas prices shooting up. There are diseases that come out of nowhere and completely alter the course of our life for a couple of years. And we look at people and we say, like, how are you going to fix this for me? So you're, like, you're going to be my leader. Take care of these problems for me. Or if they don't, because we're not perfect. All right, well, let's get rid of you. Let's pick a new one. And we're coming up now into an election year, 2024. And I expect a good portion of, you know, news is going to center around, like, okay, so who are our candidates? How are they debating? What are they saying? What are the poll numbers telling us? What are they promising? What are they going to do for us? And it's really easy to get swept up in that and to get distracted by, right, okay, who's our next leader here in our country? And are they as good as the last one? Or are they better? Are they going to fix our problems for us? Or what are we going to do if they don't? Right? Are we just going to wait it out for another four years and then switch over? Are we going to try to impeach if they don't do a good enough job for us? They're limited in what they can do. Right? Whomever our, the president is that we elect at the end of next year, good or bad, by our standards, they are imperfect. We still compare ourselves to the sinful world around us, too. This was part of the problem that the Israelites had, that they were surrounded by people who didn't follow God, who had decided this is the way to do it, right? We're going to have a king who will lead us into battle, be this figure for us, and the Israelites said that they wanted that, too, right? It wasn't a, a notion that it just kind of drew out of nowhere. They were looking around. They were looking around at the kingdoms that their God was smashing apart to give them the promised land and saying, like, well, I want to have what they have, which is kind of wild when you think about it. <laughs> now, we still do the same thing. I mean, not in quite the same way, necessarily, but we still look around at what the world around us has and what the world around us values. And it's easy to get swept up in that, to see a neighbor with a really nice car or a nice house, right? This idea of keeping up with the Joneses. What do I look like? How do other people view me? Right, we do this on a national level too. We compete, right? We had, you know, the space race. Who can maintain the biggest military and keep their country safest, right? Whose economy are we competing with, right? The United States was right up there at the top for a long time and I don't think that our economy is the strongest in the world anymore and we have that tendency to compare ourselves, right, as a nation to other nations around us. Can we have what they have? Can we be better than them? And what this tells me is that we still need a king, one king. We still need a perfect king, and there is only one person who can do that for us, which is kind of weird to think you know, in our, our country that kind of formed around this idea that a king was bad, 
right? Throwing off a king and trying something new. Uh, there's, a, there's a quote, I will, I will paraphrase at the very least, and I believe it's attributed to Winston Churchill. Uh, he said that democracy is the worst form of government except all those other forms that have been tried, right? And over the last couple hundred years, we have kind of held democracy up as this gold standard, but it's, it's not. As followers of God, we are not meant to be a democracy. We are meant to serve under one king. A king who will rule over us, who will give us instructions that we are meant to follow, who will protect us, who will give us victory, who will sustain us in his love. There is only one perfect king that we need, and that is Jesus Christ. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, our Father, our Creator, our King. God, I pray that you help us remember that we owe our allegiance only to you. God, not to be swept up in distractions of the world, not to be tempted to compare ourselves to other people or other countries or the ways of the sinful world around us. For God, to remember that your ways are perfect, that your plan is perfect. And even God, when you let us make choices on our own, you are still working your perfect will. God, you have an amazing plan for us and such great love that you would share that with us to give us hope. That you have appointed your son to be our savior and to be our king forever. Father, we love you. You alone are worthy of all our worship and our praise. In this coming year, God, I pray that you would help us to remember who you are every day, Father, to remember that you are our King and all that you do for us, all you have done and all you continue to do in your faithfulness every day. God, we pray to you in the name of your Son, our Savior, our King, Jesus.